Next up, we're excited to present a panel on gaming for health, how video games are revolutionizing healthcare. So please welcome to the stage our fantastic panelists, Stanley Pierre-Louis, President and CEO of the Entertainment Software Association, Eddie Martucci, CEO and co-founder of Akili, Mirelle Phillips, founder of Studio Elsewhere, and Laura Tabakoff, assistant professor of rehabilitation at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Please welcome our panelists to the stage. Give me a warm round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you all being here. And I'm excited to have this conversation um, about a really important topic the intersection of health and video games. I'm going to do a brief introduction of our panelists today, starting from stage left all the way to the right, and then we will get started in our conversation. Dr. Laura Tabakoff is the assistant professor um, for, uh, th at the Department of Rehabilitation and Human Performance at Mount Sinai, and she really focuses as a clinical research uh, neuroscientist and does clinical trials and a number of novel techniques looking at chronic pain. Today, we're going to be focusing on VR and its use in healthcare applications, but the topic can go as, as wide as we want it to today because of her great experience. Uh, Mirel Phillips is founder and CEO of Studio um, Elsewhere, an innovation company developing bio-experimental environments to support brain health. Um, many people know about the recharge rooms, but there are many other health outcomes and treatments that they provide for healthcare workers. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, Eddie Martucci, Dr. Eddie Martucci is CEO and co-founder of Akili Interactive. Um, he had this bold vision of bringing together video games and cognitive health and treatments and uh, is probably best known for their flagship uh, product, Endeavor RX, uh, which is an FDA-approved treatment for ADHD with children. Um, I think maybe we will start off there, Eddie, um, and talk a little bit about the experience of, of Endeavor RX, both how the patient experiences it, and then if you go back a bit into the process of how you got it approved, because that's a very rare thing for this type of prescription treatment to get approved through the FDA and its European counterpart. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, thanks for having me. And you're right, it's rare, and it, it was a little crazy um, about 10 years ago when we said we're going to try to get this product, which comes from amazing technology um, out of a neuroscience lab at UCSF. Um, we said we want to get this thing approved by the FDA before we had talked to the FDA. And the first time we approached the FDA, they said, we've never seen anything quite like this, so we're not sure how to handle it. So that gives you a sense of what the journey was, right? A lot of education, a lot of work. But if I zoom out to the vision we had and, and the product we wanted to build here, we want a product that in the moment of the experience is not edutainment, right? Kids and adults know when you're playing something that is edutainment, right? When it's like meant to be good for you and it's, it's a really bad experience. We didn't want it to be an ugly pig, we used to say, right? Where you paint the pig and, and it's a little bit prettied up. We wanted in the bones of the experience to be an entertainment product, a real video game. Um, and we used to say that in the moment of the experience, we want patients to forget that they're using a medicine product, that in fact they're just using a fun video game. So that's the ethos that we designed Endeavor RX under. Um, and we actually founded the company with myself and others who came from the biotechnology and biopharma world, and some of my co founders who came from Lucasfilm and EA and some of the biggest game companies. And together, we built this, this product. Uh, we took it, the path was to take it all the way through clinical trials. So we've done large scale clinical trials, just like you'd expect from a pharmaceutical um, product. We have taken it to the FDA, a two year review process for the first time. Um, and Endeavor RX is now the uh, first and still the only uh, FDA approved video game out there. So it was a long journey took a long time. I think there's a lot of things we could learn now going forward. We pointed the first product in ADHD, focusing on attention. That's really what this technology does. It activates the attention networks in the brain, so how you control your attention functioning. But this approach can go extremely broad, right, to any area of neurology or neuroscience and probably beyond. So I'm hoping that what we learned there in the process and the design um, allows us and hopefully other companies to have legs to bring many, many, many of these types of products to people over the coming years. 
That's exciting. Mirel, tell us about the products you've been working on and the experiences and what the outcomes are that you're trying to find um, for the end user. So we've been developing these immersive environments that are across both within healthcare settings and in the home environment as well too. And one of the ones you mentioned, the recharge rooms, it took this pandemic for I think people to connect the dots that it's not just about in healthcare treating a patient, you also have to treat the provider because their burnout is what's interdependent with patient cares and patient outcomes. And there's very limited research and different types of resources for what's basically propping up our healthcare system. So we had to scale that incredibly quickly during the pandemic to get it out to about 60 hospitals in just a few years. And I think what, there, there's so much that we've learned, but I think essentially using immersive technology provides something that is incredibly resource efficient to people that are time impoverished. All providers, healthcare workers, have less than 15 minutes to get something that's gonna support their cognitive needs, their emotional needs, what's going to kind of broaden the buffer that they have to deliver excellent patient care. And then what we see just on the administrator side is when you pair what something is that's quite popular to experience with just robust data and analytics and the research that we're seeing with our academic partners at Mount Sinai, there, there's something there that everybody is learning from around well-being that has all these other outcomes as well too and, and translations that's moving the needle forward collectively. Wow, Laura, uh, you study chronic pain. We're focused today on VR and its use in pain management, but I know that you look at this landscape really broadly. Maybe talk about the use of technology, focusing it on VR and other areas in pain management and how it impacts patients and what the advances might look like. Yeah, so um, there is enough neuroscientific advancements for us to be treating chronic pain in better ways than we are traditionally treating. So traditional treatments usually involve medication, opioids still, despite our knowledge about the devastating effects of the opioid crisis, still prescribed for chronic pain, and it's not an effective treatment for chronic pain. And other than that, surgery and intervention. So I think it's our need to be providing better care, and we have neuroscientific advancements showing that actually the brain plays a big role when treating pain, and we should be focusing on that and also empowering patients with knowledge about that, because patients are usually mind blown when I say, hey, actually your brain plays a big role in your chronic pain, and we should be targeting that with digital therapeutics and VR, and we have the technology for it, and everyone is very excited about it. Patients are, I would say, desperate for these types of approaches. Um, it's 20% of the American population living with chronic pain, and if you think about the size of that market and the number of people, it's millions of Americans suffering, and only 10% actually feel um, any pain relief with their traditional approaches. So I think it's really our role to be providing better um, options and technologies here for it. We ran a few clinical trials at Mount Sinai and the results have been outstanding for virtual reality and chronic pain. So I think we have the knowledge and we have information from these clinical trials to really advance the field and it's just a matter of building the right collaborations um, and making sure that we're offering something better. I've heard that beyond chronic pain, it might also work for burn victims and people who suffer a lot of trauma, even if it's shorter term, relatively speaking. Is that, is that pretty accurate? Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of overlap with chronic pain is just one manifestation. But when we're thinking about stress, anxiety, trauma, OCD, um, phobias, I think VR plays a big role in providing patients with the opportunity of experiencing, for instance, if someone's afraid of leaving their house, the opportunity to experience that in a safe environment guided by a therapist, or just VR using the possibility of harnessing a healthier brain-body connection, um, which is something that we leverage a lot at Mount Sinai as well in our clinical trials. And the technology is there, we just need to link it and making sure that we are advancing the field. Putting patients first, so I think one of the main issues that we see is that there's this top-down model that doctors will prescribe something for stress management or anxiety or just tell patients, hey, why don't you breathe? 
um, but we need to actually give tools for patients to learn how to breathe. I mean, at least it never worked with me. <laughs> so, you know, I think technology is here for us first to empower the patients and really put them first and, hey, and for us to listen and learn and advance the field with that knowledge. Eddie, as, as you're making these games, and there are video games, they're viewed as entertainment, but you're using them as a prescription treatment. How do you balance that, uh, both in terms of public perception, but also for the patient, mm -hmm. to ensure that it's having the intended effect, but maybe not too much? At least that may be a perception. Yeah, it, it's honestly something we're still trying to get right, um, because you're right, there's like what I'd call overcorrection on either end of the spectrum, right? So if you come to, uh, Endeavor RX, our, our product for kids, if you come to that product and say, oh, I want to use this because I'm looking for a new game and this could be really cool. Or if a parent says, hey, try this game out because you know, it might be something you really like. That's not the right model because we're erring too far on the entertainment side. Like This is meant to be a treatment. Um, it's a serious thing. It's meant to try to address the neurological issues that children are having. And we know that if it's used properly and intensely for four weeks, we get amazing clinical outcomes. At the same time, the other side is also not helpful, <laughs> where we say, well, it's a video game and therefore it can't possibly be medicine, right? And so forget you know, the video game. And in fact, we, there's a very small minority of doctors who still say, I won't possibly recommend a video game to my patients. I think that number is dwindling. Um, but there is in a minority perception out there that video games are bad for you. And so there's a little bit of a, a hurdle, a cognitive hurdle that, we, that the world has to get over to think about these things as actually serving the same purpose. Um, and that's really our goal. If we can say that the design from the user experience side is supporting the treatment, and vice versa, the mechanics inside the treatment itself are actually integrated directly into the design so that they feel smooth and they're easy to use. That's the win, right? I think if anyone thinks about the world as, I, I always react to binary positions, right? It's either this or that. That can't possibly be true. It's never, it's almost never true anyways in life. You don't live in Washington. Uh, <laughs> right, well, we all see what happens in Washington. Um, but I think here that's, that's the point is it's not, it's either for fun or it's supposed to be helpful. The ability to have both is actually what is gonna change the world. Um, because today in mental health care, you have patients that, I mean, we are all patients in some form or other, have probably never said, oh, I can't wait to do my treatment today. Or I can't wait to have that aspect of care. No, we fear it, right, it's scary. Um, and so if we can actually bring the best of both worlds together, we can have effective treatments that actually people look forward to. They're in a positive mindset to come into, and many more people will seek care. So um, I do think you're right that there's nuance that needs to be broken down, and we're trying to do that all the time. It's not easy, but I think the more that we have these types of forums, the more we have people and companies from the healthcare world and the entertainment world supporting this, coming together shoulder to shoulder, I think the world is starting to learn that these don't have to be disparate things. They can actually be one and the same. Yeah, you know, Mirel, it's funny. I'm listening to him, and I'm thinking about the work that you've been working on. His may be prescriptive, but yours is restorative. How do you balance what you take from the medical profession into the product, and what do you take from game mechanics into the product? Like, how, how do you make that balance, and, and, and where's that line to create that feeling of restoration? Okay, so in answering this, I'm curious how many people here right now are playing Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Okay. Got some hands. Because I think fundamentally what we understand about games that are like that are incredibly translational to the type of work that we're doing. Because in an open world environment, this is what I came from and what I've been adapting into healthcare is that you essentially are in an experience that is predicated on uncertainty. And the world is something that you're exploring and it's co-creative and it's establishing your agency in the process of doing that. And as Eddie said, like everybody is on a healthcare journey. If you're not currently in one, you have been through one, you're gonna be in one, there's someone that you love. 
that's currently in one as well, too. And I think what incredible games do that we're applying here is that they show you that there's a map. Because one of the fundamental experiences that we all have is this destabilization, disorientation. And what we see in the game mechanics is that there's still somewhere, it's, it's not linear. You're on this winding journey. And just because you had a setback one day doesn't mean that you're back at the beginning of the map. You're able to see how it unfolds and then it unlocks as well. And you're able to bring that sense of curiosity and discovery when we're talking about what this is at the heart of interactivity is agency. So it's fundamentally shifting this dynamics within healthcare and medicine as something that's not just this like paternalistic relationship between provider and patient. It's something that essentially is bucking the entire system of the way that we're giving agency as well too, where it's desperately needed. For a minute there, I thought you were specifically talking to me. <laughs> like, yeah, I have Damn something like. in my PT. Laura's going to prescribe you something. <laughs> like, wow, this is kind of personal. I just told you that backstage. <laughs> no, um, uh, same question for you, uh, Laura. You know, video game design is clearly important in thinking about the VR treatment, but so is that medical uh, training. So how do you import the medical techniques and understandings all right, because you've outlined some of the ones that have been helpful, but others that have maybe been overprescribed in a way that isn't healthy, and bringing in new technology. So how do you achieve that balance, and maybe if you have some examples of it? Yeah, so I think a good example of that is what we learned with our clinical trial. I think uh, we saw that virtual reality was able to decrease levels of pain, um, different kinds of environments, both distractive ones and those embodiment ones where we're really harnessing that brain-body connection. Um, but I think the main and the most exciting finding for me was that the more present someone felt in the environment, the more the environment resonated with them, and the more they enjoyed the experience, the better their pain outcomes. So for me, I think we really need to focus on that to guide the next stage of developing these environments. Like Eddie was saying, enjoying your therapy can actually be very helpful and actually can improve your outcomes tremendously. So either that's in chronic pain or neurorehabilitation. So if someone with stroke or traumatic brain injury is doing their rehab, why can it be gamified in a way that is like the most exciting video game and the best graphics, not something childish, like not something that is deemed down and toned down just because someone has a cognitive impairment. No, it needs to be the highest level. And I think that's why it's so exciting to be here and to learn from the industry and um, because I think there's a lot of potential to, to further this and really focusing on listening to patients. Patients often tell me, I want to do more VR, but you need to improve these <laughs> uh, environments. And I'm like, you're right, it's our job, and that's why we need to collaborate with industry. We, I want to take off on something Laura was saying there. I totally agree, and we actually have data on this now. We've presented some of this data. It's one of my favorite things to talk about, so you're going to have to rein me back in. All right, don't let me go too long. Um, so I think this will excite people. Um, because we build a mobile video game, we actually capture frame rate data. Okay, so we capture 60 frames a second data on most platforms. In a healthcare product, that's unheard of. In video games, it's, it's normal. But in a healthcare product, unheard of. We were able to build profiles of uh, our data science team, not we like me, I don't know how to do it. Our data science team was able to build profiles of engagement because we always got the question, is there a relationship, is there like a dose response, right? Mm -hmm. How much someone uses this relating to their outcome. And the interesting thing in our data, when we looked at it from the standard way, like did they take all the minutes of their treatment over the course of a month, there's not a very strong relationship, which is weird, because you'd say, well, the more someone plays, you should get a better treatment. There's some minimum level that people use the product and they get a benefit, but we didn't see a big relationship. But what did have a strong relationship with clinical outcomes and improvement was the engagement, which we can build from the actual data, the performance data of how someone's playing. So what I mean by that is we can take, after a few minutes of treatment, we know how hard someone's trying and how close it is to their maximum ability level, right? Cognitively. We know how quickly you can respond to things, how, what your motor function looks like. And the more someone's engaged, the more uh, what we call effort they're putting in, right? Effort's kind of obvious, but we call it effortful engagement. So not just do you have the screen open and you're going through the motions. Are you locked in? Are you yeah. all in on the treatment and you're actually performing near your max level? That correlates with outcomes even 
using much less of the recommended treatment time. So this is where the world's going, where it's much less about the way we think about traditional medical treatments, like did you take your pill today? It's more how did you take your medicine? And that's something that actually the game industry has figured out. That's all product designers and user experience designers think about is how someone's engaging. We've never thought about that in healthcare, but we can now when we're using these types of platforms. No, oh, that, 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 that's kind of incredible. I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Laura, and mm -hmm. come down, and I'm gonna ask you guys to do an elevator pitch because this is Games Beat, it's about the business of games, and there's an opportunity to speak to game designers, investors, uh, people who run companies, about why invest in the science that you're working on, right? Because a lot of the work that you are all talking about have been funded by the medical profession or pharma but not so much within the video game world, and yet the applications in making games that are not edutainment, as you put it, but really a powerful and, and helpful uh, come from the best game designers in the world, which come to GamesBeat. Free advertisement for Dean Takashi. Um, <laughs> so maybe, w what's your elevator pitch on why there should be more investment in this space as you see it? I mean, my elevator pitch is that patients deserve better, and we have the technology to del deliver better and treat patients as high-performance athletes. So, um, I mean, investing in technology is going to be allowing people with spinal cord injuries, stroke, ne any neurorehabilitation need or chronic pain to really get access to the highest level and the, the best available technology out there for their needs. And you're seeing the clinical outcomes that actually support that, which is absolutely, really and it's all evidence-based. So there are evidence-based principles published that we can leverage and just use technology to deliver that, treating our patients as high-performing athletes. Wow, I like the way you put that, Mirel. Yeah, I mean, the this is the combination: is that we have clinical outcomes, we have dosage models. What Eddie's working on, what I'm working on, what we're we're seeing is that your treatment can actually be this non-pharmacological dose. And it can have holistic impact as well, too. And so when you're looking at all of this in healthcare, part of it is that what we want to imagine, that is what we want. I mean, this healthcare, we don't get to live in just, there's not high, hype cycles for us. You have to have outcomes. You have to have things that are quite tangible. So when you're seeing that there is this world where it's imaginative, where it has this level of engagement, and that's like coupled with the clinical outcomes and that this is reducing a lot of the, um, and mitigating some of the impacts that just so much more intensive types of drugs and surgeries do. I mean, that's an incredibly exciting future. Yeah, for your other pitch, I want you to also talk about what you have coming down the pike because sure. you're in the process of actually building out even more opportunities for prescription treatment through video games. We are, we are. Um, so my, my elevator pitch would be, I don't know the exact number, but I think we can estimate who uses pharmaceutical medication today. What's the population of this world that uses, and we're, I mean, it's in the billions, right? Billions. Is there any reason that digital treatments things that are delivered actually more scalably, because they can be downloaded right to your phone or, or your house. Arguably, a better user experience, actually, forget arguably, inarguably, a better user experience because they can be built on entertainment platforms. Is there any reason that that can't even have a sliver of the market that pharmaceuticals have today to treat people? Of course not, they, it should. Yeah. So the addressable market for where these technologies could go is hundreds of millions to billions of people on this planet. And actually, all of us who are patients know that we always want better and more accessible and more streamlined medicine. So from a top-down perspective, the industry is as big as any other area of medicine. And right now, we just have a few products. Um, so we're a public company now, and I think about this a lot. I talk to a lot of investors. Um, we started with a product and an indication, which serves a couple million kids. For those kids, for that family's uh, set, it's hopefully amazing. It's transformative. But why we're really here is that's just one area of the brain and one small market. Where we want to go, and I think many other companies and programs want to go, is every other disease condition on Earth 
most of them can probably be treated in some form digitally, or at least have part of a treatment of this. So um, where we can go with this is as big as any other area of medicine is, which from an investment perspective, the return on that investment could be billions, many billions. Um, where we're going, just as one example of how to step into a first market and then expand, we have a prescription product in children with ADHD. It's an addressable market of about 2 million kids that struggle with ADHD, specifically the attention issues. Um, we just recently received data, I think you're alluding to, we just recently got um, large-scale clinical trial data that this actually even more dramatically helps adults who deal with ADHD. So adult ADHD, and we published adults with depression, helps their attention, their focus, their ability, ability to complete tasks, um, go to work, et cetera. So we are quickly moving into um, the adult market. And even just for us and our one company, that goes to all of a sudden somewhere in the 10 to 20 million patient addressable market. Um, we're really excited about it. Stay tuned. We haven't announced um, too much yet, but we plan uh, very quickly to be uh, looking at how we can bring our product into the adult market. Um, and we'll be working with the FDA to do that as well. So really excited about that. But I think it's just take our company and then magnify it by hundreds, hopefully. And now you're addressing a really big slice of the world pie. I, I wanted to leave a couple minutes for questions if anyone had any before I went on. Is there any burning questions someone has for these amazing panelists? Got one there. OK, um, you're going to have to stand up. Yes, yeah. Oh, oh sorry. I just I saw an arm. So the problem that I see uh, is that the medical industry is completely different business than the game industry. And that, like for instance, you have to have a code in order to get charged in the medical industry if you want reimbursement. And if you don't have that medical code, then you don't get anything. And that a lot of people go into this thinking, you know, hey, I'm just going to make a game and people will, will use it but that's not the case. So how do you overcome that? Or did you get a medical code that's specifically so that you can get reimbursement from, or the, the, the insurance will pay for it and the doctors can get yeah. reimbursed for it and the whole cycle, the business cycle is completely different. So how, how did you navigate that? It is completely different, but it's changing. So it's a good point. Um, the insurance industry is going to be the last to adopt and we could have a whole panel where I could tell you all of the ridiculousness that insurers will go through not to cover digital treatments, but they're starting to. Mm -hmm. uh, every quarter, there's more and more coverage, so I think it's coming. But yes, we, we actually have both a medical procedure code and a drug-like code, strange enough. I think we were the first company to have a drug code for a software product, so it can be billed as a pharmacy benefit or a medical benefit. Um, it's, it's actually less about the infrastructure. It's more about insurers stepping up and covering new products for patients. They always take forever, but that's changing. The other thing that I think we can look at, though, to, to say that these fields are not that different, yes, medicine's hard, but just look at what's happening in the virtual care and telemedicine space. You have companies like Hims and Hers and Roe and others that have stepped into medicine, but with a more consumer-directed model, and those are starting to scale, actually. So you have a few different business models, some that feel like traditional medicine, some that feel like consumer tech that are actually both serving markets with real medicine, um, I think that's just gonna keep expanding over time. So I, I think it's a distinction that's fading and all of the things you mentioned can be done and they are being done. Just a quick follow-up for you both. Um, what's the reaction been with hospital staff but also hospital administrators beyond insurance and the, all of the, uh, the, you know, that infrastructure? Starting with you, Laura, what's been the reaction of like sort of hospital administrators and staff it's all about the data that you share. So when you're showing that you're improving patient outcomes, they start to listen. Um, and when you talk about adoption and clinicians needing a way out, because, and Eddie, you can speak to that, but people working in chronic pain management or um, mental health management, they have patients that are not responding to their treatment. So they also need somewhere else to send their patients to. So the need is there, and stakeholders and hospital leadership is becoming more and more interested by the path that Eddie's taking with the FDA approval and making sure that you're speaking to the insurance and having reimbursement codes yeah. is absolutely essential. And Mirel, I mean, the, 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 I, I just imagine that there was a huge swing before and then during COVID and the work that you were doing. Yeah, I, I mean, we've seen very quick adoption in the most red tape bureaucratic <laughs> conservative world, which is in, in hospitals and hospital administrations. And I think there's something to be said about when you're able to 
develop certain types of solutions that are have a form of equity in them and accessibility yeah. as well. And there's there's popularity and there's outcomes. That's what speaks Perfect. to what that entire industry is. And I think that we're just all seeing that it's a generative model when you're involving the clinicians, the neuroscientists, the researchers, the industry, and getting it out to those that are most vulnerable as quickly as possible. Well, I want to thank these amazing panelists. I want to thank you for your question, and thank you for all being here. What a great discussion, and we're around if you want to talk to us later today. Thank you.